Good, good evening, everyone. I realise it's not quite seven o'clock, but I am allowed to just read out the introduction as it's not part of the agenda. So, good evening and welcome to the Working and Borough Council Planning Committee. A few points before we commence. We do have a PA system. Mobile phones should be off or on silent and no fire drill is planned. The proceedings are filmed and will be available on the Woken Borough website. You will see from the camera position that the committee members, council officers and registered speakers will normally be recorded. The speakers may ask not to be filmed, but their comments will be audio recorded. The planning committee is made up of nine elected members. And I'll just ask them to introduce themselves one by one, starting on my far right. Angus Ross representing Working Without Ward. Wayne Smith, member for Hurst. Rochelle Sheriff Dubay, member for Winch. Malcolm Richards, member for Norwich in Working Town. Tim Holton Hawkden in Lower Early. Bill Stone representing Lowton in Woodley. Uh, John Jarvis representing Twyford. Uh, and I'm Carl Doran for Bulge and Whitespace. Well, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, members. We are supported and advised by a variety of professional council officers. And I'll ask those people to introduce themselves to start on my far right. Carl Minam, I'm part of the committee. My name's Cindy Jennings, I'm a legal officer for the committee. I'm Justin Turvey, lead officer for development management. Uh, I'm Chris Easton, I'm the service manager for Work from Horace. Thank you very much. When we get on to the individual applications, I would introduce the case officer at the appropriate time. The procedure. This is a quasi-judicial committee with formal set procedures and conduct. Firstly, the planning officer will present each application. Then I will call in turn only those that are pre-registered to speak. Please come forward to the table. The microphone is controlled by the grey button on the base. The time limit of three minutes for each category of speaker will be strictly enforced. So please ensure you get your key points across within your allotted time. Members of the committee are interested in the quality of what you have to say and not for how long you speak. And I have to say, again, emphasise that only those who are pre registered to speak may do so. Following the planning officer's presentation and the comments of registered speakers, the planning committee members will consider, question and seek clarification for the application and hopefully reach a decision which may or may not agree with the officer's recommendation. Finally, a reminder. The local planning authority's role is to determine any valid planning application using local and national planning policy. Our role is not to suggest alterations to, to schemes, whether they are a good idea or indeed whether they are needed, whether they are too costly or whether there are alternative uses. Thank you very much and I shall move on to tonight's agenda. Right, firstly then, apologies. Apologies have been submitted from Councillor Chris, uh, Chris Bauer and Jeff. Thank you very much. Now we have the minutes from two meetings. So the first meeting was on June the 13th. So are there any amendments to those minutes? No, just show of hands then that everyone's happy with them. That's unanimous. And the second meeting was on June the 25th. Are there any alterations to those minutes? No. All those in favour then? Thank you. Right. Item number 19 is declarations of interest. Councillor Jarvis. I wish to declare a personal interest in item 22. I did attend a parish council meeting where this application was discussed, but I am coming to this committee with an open mind and I am able to participate in this meeting. Thank you, and Councillor Sanson. Yeah, I declare an interest in the second item on the application, item number 172704. I have a prejudicial interest, and for that reason, I will leave the meeting and take no part in it at that point. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, well, I'd like to make it clear for item 21, Bournemouth Data Centre, that I was very involved up to 14 months ago as executive member for the planning of the idea. But took no part at all in the planning application that came later and therefore feel totally free uh, to consider what's said and, and to take full part. Thank you very much. <coughs> Are there any applications to be deferred or withdrawn? There's none, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. 
Right, then moving on then to the first item, which is agenda item 21 on page 17, which is the Bullmersh Leisure Centre. The full application for a place in the Leisure Centre that includes a six lane swimming pool, teaching pool, gymnasium, four court sports hall, two studios, cafe, parking, and landscaping. And it's before the committee, and it's a major application, and that applicant is Woking Borough Council. And I will hand over to the case officer, Mark Roger. Over to you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I won't read the, the description of that, as uh, you succinctly uh, said. I'm um, just moving on to a brief presentation. Um, so this is the location plan, um, and the existing leisure centre is here. We've got Woodlands Avenue to the south. Um, in my report, you would have seen Shell Gate Wall mentioned, which is just here, where the cursor is on the screen. Almost School, which is to the north of the site here, and to the west of the site, we have Addington School here. Some members may be aware of the Gulf facility, which is there to the north here. Um, this is an aerial photo of the site just to show the context of the area in a bit more detail. Um, as you can see, that's the existing measure centre there, the car park is there, we can to the south. Um, just moving through some existing photos quickly. Um, this is taken from the Axis Road. Um, members will be aware if they've been on site recently, it is actually boarded off the site. So these are slightly over. have got some more recent photographs. But um, if we start on the top left, this is taken from the Axis Road, um, looking at the left centre, and you can see the existing Axis in the bottom right corner there. Um, the building just for the cursors is the caretaker's um, accommodation there. Um, this is looking back down the access road, so Woodlands Avenue is just there where the cursor is, and this is looking at the rear of the existing building. And to the left, you can just see um, Bournemouth School's existing car park there. Um, this is uh, looking from Woodlands Avenue. Once again, you've got the caretaker's building um, there, and you can just make out the existing building in the background. You can just see the large TPO oak tree here, which is being retained as part of the development. There's a uh, maple tree just behind it as well, which is also being retained. And this footway right here is Shell Game Walk. And um, once again, this is with exactly just looking north directly at the sides of the existing since then, and care to have accommodations on the right. Um, this is the site at the moment. Um, you can just see the demolition started works. Um, as you'll see from the update, prior approval has been granted for demolition. <coughs> Um, they have commenced demolition on site um, now. Um, and this is just swinging around, looking slightly, so I should say that the back here is um, having a back to Woodlands Avenue, it's looking at the uh, centre, TPO entry here, and you can just see the houses in Shell Gate Walk there. Um, this is taken from Shell Gate Walk. If we start in the top left hand corner, you can just see the hoarding of the site to the right, and you can see the residential properties and also their front gardens to the left. Um, the photograph from the bottom of the corner is stood on a footpath from Rushbrook Road, linking it into Shell Gable. And as you can see, the um, very the monolithic slab of the existing side elevation there. <coughs> this is the proposed site plan. Um, so the existing, the, sorry, the proposed building will be located here. The sports hall will be to the left. Um, the end entrance will be here to the south, and this part of the right will be the uh, swimming pool. Um, once again, you can see Shell Day Wall. These are the two trees being retained, TPO, um, Oak and Maple. Uh, this will be the main entrance of Woodlands Avenue, the main pedestrian entrance. The access, just to note, is being moved. It's approximately where the cursor is there. Um, it is being moved more to the north. Um, there will obviously be a rearrangement of the car park as well, which is mentioned in the report. Um, I put this plan up just because the previous one you couldn't really see what's happened to Shell Gate Walk. This isn't particularly clear, but hopefully it does show a bit there. So it is being retained. There will also be a circulation footpath around the building which will link into Shell Gate Walk just here. And there will be opportunities for planting and landscaping in these uh, landscape buffers um, here and here. Um, so these are the elevations. So this is the south elevation, which will be the front elevation to the site. Um, this is the glazed entrance of the building. Once again, the sports are to the left and the much lower swimming pool will be to the right. Um, this is the rear of the building at the bottom. So this will be the elevation that fronts onto Bournemouth School. Um, what may be nowhere is this door here where the cursor is. This will be where school pupils will actually enter the sports facilities. So this will be for use of school, uh, 
for my school as well. And what that allows, it allows for people to enter the building without mixing the general public. So it um, mitigates safeguarding issues um, and sort of risk assessments and all that sort of thing. And there is quite a lot of detail in the application of how the building will be subdivided um, in school hours when it is being used by those school pupils. Um, so starting at the top, this is the east elevation, this is the elevation front on the shell they will, as I mentioned in my report, there will be uh, opaque glazing, so there will be some interest um, to that, although there will be no direct outlet from it, there will be some interest to in that elevation. And uh, moving on to the bottom elevation, this will be the elevation that fronts onto the access road, and you can just see the glazed atrium of the entrance there. Uh, moving on to the floor plans quickly, um, you've got sports all to the left, the swimming pool to the right with a training pool, the cafe entrance to the south, um, and then changing room facilities in the middle uh, with some other WCs. And then moving on, this is the first floor, and as you can see, there's a gym, some studios, and some more changing rooms. Uh, this is just a section quickly just to show you how the building will be uh, subdivided. So you've got sports all to the left, and then you've got the uh, gym facilities up on the first floor there, and you've got the swimming pool to the right hand side there. Um, quickly just enlarge this part of the location map just to quickly show members the black outline is the existing leisure centre and the red outline um, denotes the proposed leisure centre. In my report I mentioned about floor area and there's about 55% increase in floor area. When you just do it on footprint it comes to about 30% so the footprint, although it's larger, it isn't as big as the overall floor area. Um, it's just, in terms of the large footprint it's not actually too much of what's there already. Um, this is a section which was helpfully submitted just to show how the building sits with um, the properties in Shellgate Walk. Um, so you can see the building there. Shellgate Walk is just annotated there, and this is the properties here. And I mentioned in my report that you can just see the building is actually lower than the apex of the roof of those houses. Members will um, notice as well the dotted black line there, that shows the outline of the existing sports hall. So whilst it's nearer to Shellgate Walk, it is quite a bit lower as well. Um, of note as well is that the applicants drawn in a 25 degree um, unobstructed zone of daylight just to show they've been overshadowed. They've actually been quite generous there because it should actually be taken from the top or midpoint of the window, so there'd actually be a bit more, um, a bit more space for daylight than is actually shown on that. Um, I'll just quickly shoot, uh, put this planning. So this shows the extension to uh, almost school car park. So we just go here at the moment the car park stop, stops approximately there, so just be an extension there and a rearrangement of the car park. Um, these are just some CGI images, um, so this is from Woodlands Avenue, just showing how it will be, and that's the sort of circulation footpath around the building, the swimming pool to the right. Um, once again, this is just the access way in the leisure um, centre. Um, there are a couple of updates, Chairman, um, just to draw your attention to. Um, I mentioned about the prior approval for demolition being granted, and therefore demolition works can commence on site. Um, in terms of the jobs created, I thought I'd, I'd elaborate on that a bit more. In my report, I mentioned there'd be 64 in total um, in the proposed building. To break that down a bit more, um, it's been advised there'd be approximately 16 full-time staff and the rest would be uh, part-time staff. Um, so the split is about 25-75, so 25 full-time, 75 part-time. Um, it's also been advised there'd be probably about a maximum of 24 staff on site at any one given time as well. Um, the other point to note, on paragraph 8 on page 27, it should be that the, the main two-storey section of the building, so the, mid, the midpoint of the building, would be 10.5 metres in height and would be 2 metres higher than the existing leisure centre. But as I've shown, the swing floor has actually dropped down quite a bit from the existing building. Um, condition 10 uh, relates to the site of the parking arrangement and highways are just um, advised that that condition should actually be re reworded. The condition is uh, a site of the parking condition, but they've asked it to be worded as shown in the update sheet. Um, I won't read that out, but um, hopefully that, if members want me to elaborate that, I can do. Um, Chairman, I would actually like to just add one more update as a belt and braces approach. Um, the applicant did submit a uh, renewable energy and sustainability report which sets out um, at least 10% energy being generated from low carbon and renewable sources. Um, so I would like to add that as a condition as well, even though they're, they're likely going to do it and I trust they will do. Um, it's just to add that as a condition as well at the end. So it would read something along the lines of um, the development hereby approved shall be carried out in accordance with the energy and sustainability statement, adding in the reference number, 
demonstrating at least 10% of the energy being created from low carbon and re renewable sources, um, with the usual and otherwise green writing by the local planning priority. Just way of uh, description, um, in the uh, energy statement they did show that about 30% of um, would be generated by low carbon technology. Um, and that would be a mix of air source, uh, air source heat pumps um, and combined heating power um, infrastructure. Um, so with those updates, Chairman, um, actually I'll just quickly elaborate on the parking um, because I think that would be um, worthy to bring up now. Um, I set out in my report, the applicant provided a parking accumulation survey, and that's based on the TRIPS database uh, for similar uses in, in similar sustainable locations. And what that showed is the weekday peak would occur around 7 p.m., and that would um, require about 65 parking spaces. Now, 70 are proposed, so in the weekday peak, there would, there would be enough parking on site. In the weekend peak, um, that would occur about 9 a.m. in the morning, and the parking accumulation survey showed that that would require about 72, papers, 72 spaces. So, whilst there was a potential way to spill of only two on weekends, um, What's been agreed um, is that the, uh, there will be a unilateral undertaking and this approval is subject to a unilateral <laughs> undertaking and that will secure uh, the Bournemouth School Car Park and Paddington Car Park to be used outside school hours for the leisure centre. Um, and as part of that, a, a parking management plan will need to be submitted with that unilateral undertaking. So as I say, whilst there's only um, an overspill of two on weekends, um, that, that's all uncovered for in the um, all my school car park, Edmonton Scar Park, Addington School Car Park, which obviously won't be in use at, at weekends. Um, so finally, just to conclude, Chairman, um, subject to the conditions, uh, informatives and new natural undertaking, the application is recommended for approval. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, the first registered speaker then is Councillor Keith Baker representing the Woodley Town Council. Would you like to come forward? <coughs> Good evening. Good evening, all. It's uh, long been an aspiration of Woodley Town Council to have a modern, up-to-date leisure facility providing significant benefits to the local community. You may not be aware that the period between the abolition of the County Council, former owners of this facility, and 2014, the leisure centre was leased to the Town Council. The result was disastrous with minimal capital investment put in by the Town Council causing the centre to rapidly deteriorate. A cooperative approach between the Town and Borough Council working together resulted in the return of this facility back to its owners, the Borough Council, a year earlier than the lease expiry. This had immediate impact with an investment made almost immediately to rectify the more glaring issues within that current building. At the same time, in 2014, both councils started working on a plan together to provide a variety of options from refurbishment through to a total rebuild, which was the basis of what, in, uh, of what you have in front of you now. I think it's important to understand this history as it reflects totally the needs and aspirations of the residents of Woodley and North Early. It also illustrates that despite the Town Council having its own leisure uh, facility, it fully supports the proposal you have in front of you. This new leisure centre will significantly improve the community facilities and will enhance the character and appearance of the area. It will promote healthy living within the community and provide much needed facilities for the three schools that share this location. It's been a long time coming from an aspiration in 2014 to almost a reality in 2019, subject to your approval. On behalf of the Town Council, I strongly recommend the committee to approve the application before you. Thank you very much. And secondly, we have Norman Jorgensen on behalf of the applicant. If you'd like to come forward. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Now, the Bumbles Leisure Centre was built in 1974 as a two-storey community leisure centre. It had four badminton courts, small sports hall, 25 metre screen pool with five lanes. The facility, as you've already had, was getting very tired and areas were being taken out of service as condensation and decay took on its toll. It was not economic to simply upgrade the centre, so the plan is to demolish it 
and build a new one in the same place. The new leisure centre, if planning permission is granted, will be a significant enhancement on the current facility. And it will contain a four court sports hall, 25 metres six lane swimming pool, teaching pool with a movable floor, so it can be used by people of all sizes, changing facilities, two studios, a 75 station gym, a long term condition gym, and a cafe. Former school had significant use of the old leisure centre on a dual use basis. The school will have access to the sports hall and swimming pool in the new centre during town times from Monday to Friday between 9 am and 5 pm, although the swimming pool times will be reduced to two or three hours per day, leaving more time for the general public to use. Improved changing facilities will allow for the general public to be separated from school pupils to ensure safeguarding criteria are met. This will allow the community greater use of the census facilities during town time as the current facilities do not permit this. The aim is that the new leisure centre will be much better used than the old one which will help increase physical activity <coughs> in Woodley, Early and the surrounding areas. This is expected to contribute to reducing or preventing long-term health conditions. The centre rebuild also supports the Council's 21st century leisure strategy, which states that Bullmarsh will have a major improvement to ensure its <coughs> sustainability. The Council is significantly enhancing leisure facilities around the borough, and residents are making good use of these facilities, so the income generated exceeds the costs of construction and operation. The proposed new leisure centre at Bullmarsh will be a great addition to the leisure offering in the borough, and I hope you approve the plan application this evening. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, the ward councillor was uh, did register to speak, um, Councillor Shahid Yunis. And the he can't be here tonight now, but he has given me what he was going to say, and I'm just going to read that out. So if you could give me three minutes on the um, <coughs> clock, thank you. I speak to you as ward member for Bullmersh and White Cape, and Bullmersh School Governor, one of the schools which will directly benefit from this, these new developments. As a ward member, I've campaigned for a number of years for the current dilapidated building to be demolished and replaced with a new, much improved leisure facility. Our Woodley and early residents deserve better. I am speaking in favour of the proposed development, mainly for the following reasons. The improvement of the leisure facilities would be significant benefit to the local community, promoting healthy communities, providing access to high quality sports and recreation facilities, fulfilling the national policy NPPF. The proposed building would have an extended and large usage floor space and would be of keeping with the character and appearance of the surrounding area. The redevelopment and improvement of a brownfield site in a highly sustainable location is in accordance with the spatial strategy as set out in the development plan. The proposed building contains a new cafe facility and would act as a hub for the local community to meet and socialise. This site is surrounded by Bullmersh, Anderson and High Highwood schools. The proposed facilities would be heavily used by these schools. The car parking for the leisure centre would increase further by 22 spaces and would include disabled bays, electric charging points and covered cycle parking spaces. In conclusion, the proposed development will significantly improve the community facilities and would enhance the character and appearance of the area. It will promote healthy communities and is in line with the national policy and adopted core strategy. I strongly recommend the committee to approve the development of Full Motion Leisure Centre. Thank you, Councillor Shahid Yunis, member of Full Motion White Cape. Okay. Right, and I now open up to the members of the committee, as uh, we always do, the other board member, Councillor Duran. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, I kind of just want to start off with by saying um, I went through all of this and I always look for little issues and things I can ask about, and, and there aren't that many. It, it looks like a good design to me. Um, there's clearly a lot of benefits to it. Um, the major kind of, not major, small issue I had was uh, with the, that kind of pushing it out towards Shellgate Walk on the, uh, the, the eastern side. Um, it seems very close, but um, I spoke to Mark and asked him to kind of get this diagram basically to show the 25, uh, 25 degree line. Um, 
I'm quite pleased to see that it's it's really not that different than the uh, in terms of an angular distance between the two, the old and the new. So I suspect that's that's going to be okay. I, I imagine. I think there's some like seven houses in Shellgate Walk who will be affected by it along that 45 metre frontage. Um, some of them may not be happy with it, um, but overall, I mean, this is about the benefits to the, the whole community, and, and, and in this case, it kind of outweighs that, I think. Um, so I really don't have um, any other comments to make at the moment. Um, apart from, I did notice there's a point, that I just want to kind of make this point, I know the answer to the question, um, on page 28. Paragraph 11, talking about the material of the cladding will be secured by the recommended condition 3. And I just thought it would be interesting to point out that that's all about the appearance, nothing to do with the safety. Um, not that this is a residential building, but um, I find that strange. It's a bit like a sprinkler question we keep having, where we're allowed to talk about certain things and not others because they're not planning issues. But I think it's important for the public to know that we're not making decisions on those kind of things here. So I just like to mention that. Um, but that's all I've got for now. Okay. Michelle, then Angus. A couple of questions. I've noticed that if you don't have a paddling pool, you have this pool that's going up and down. What do you do with the children if you have more than one child at different ages? Uh, there's no crush that I can see there. There's no um, play area like there is in the carnival pool area. And just wondering what you're planning to do with the children in those kind of times. Um, is the car park free or pay and display that would be around there? Uh, I will say something very positive. The locations of the handicapped spaces are much better than they were during the carnival pool. They look like they're actually within the law, as opposed to the carnival pool, which seems to be taking the make occasionally. Um, and what about money for maintenance of this nice thing that goes up and down? The council is known to have uh, problems with having enough money. Uh, we have capital, but we don't really have revenue money for this. And it will be sufficient money to, to maintain it during its time, because this is not a cheap thing to maintain. Thank you for those questions. I will ask the case officer to respond on the planning issues, not the other comments. Yeah, I'm not sure for the first one's planning issue in terms of um, where would there be a crash. Uh, there is a viewing gallery here, um, but it wouldn't really be a planning issue in terms of the internal configuration of the, uh, the swimming pools. Um, in terms of maintenance, though, once again, there wouldn't be a planning issue. Um, in terms of whether the car park would be free or pay and display, um, that would be something which would come out in the um, car park management travel plan detail in terms of how they, how they manage it, but essentially um, a lot of it would be up to the, um, I know, the uh, provider on site and how they, how they wish to manage it and you know, what's, what's they do and how size really, so um, I'm not sure if that's really a sort of planning issue either, if I'm completely honest. I guess. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I think this is a great uh, design and layout here. Uh, I know when the school behind opened its new building and had this <coughs> pimple uh, sitting in front of it, uh, there was a lot of concern that uh, when, when that would be removed and it's been removed right now. So I think in terms of design layout, uh, I, I have absolutely no problems. My <coughs> question is around the parking, car parking. We know that the access road there uh, serves Addington, Bournemouth Schools, Bowles, Kingfisher, Table Tennis and the Leisure Centre and pretty much there's no control over which space they use other than Addington's car park being locked at certain times and I'm delighted to see that's now open. The figures that were quoted about parking spaces, uh, my first question then is does that include staff parking? Because there's quite an increase in the number of staff that will be involved there. Um, <clears throat> and the other really is a question about safety. Uh, it's a big issue at the moment. Uh, and taking the access to the leisure centre further into the site does, in a way, cause me some concern 
because at peak times on Saturday. Now, um, the, there's parking on the grass and everything all the way up there. So is there a plan for some management of this between not just the users of the Leisure Centre, but all the users there? Um, as I say, having adding some space as well is, is a great benefit. Um, so it, it's about managing the, the access and the parking and about staff parking. Uh, I can see it to pick it up at the point. Um, in terms of the parking, the standard is a standard for the site. We've been, actually, we've put the team through quite a bit of pressure in terms of parking to ensure because the standard that we have for a DT use like this actually is quite onerous and it's one per 10 square metres of public space, um, which actually comes out at quite a significant figure, it's about 280 spaces, uh, which obviously, which is one of the reasons we work with them to do accumulation survey. Uh, to uh, determine obviously the level of parking uh, and it's just obvious because the swimming pool you're not going to have people in all the public areas such as the toilets the walking areas the changing rooms so when you kind of break it down that's what we use the trip rates as mark mentioned earlier we use the trip rate accumulation survey to establish a more appropriate figure which took it down to 70 which basically is where the, the peak at 72 on the Saturday, which is obviously the parking they provided we've got them to alter the red line boundary to include both the Addington and Bournemouth car parks. Uh, and as Mark has mentioned, is the agreement to secure them legally, that they're available for use. There's a parking management strategy that's been secured by condition, and so that detail needs to be set out. Uh, in terms of in terms of the access, the access road itself, um, that's owned and operated by the council's property team, which obviously will own, will own uh, do own those properties on there. Uh, we have had conversations with them, and I know they've had conversations with the, the, our parking team uh, around potential ways to manage that uh, ongoing um, elements. Um, but with the parking management strategy, it's intended that those features, such as you know, the lines, parking forms, whatever it is that they wish to apply, can be controlled uh, and managed the parking site. And the question was asked about the charging. Obviously, not through this bad location is intended. The operator may obviously choose to do something different, but given the location of that area, it's not expected that that's something that would take place. Um, and then the location of the access into the. Um, you're right, there is some congestion. We get some congestion around all schools, unfortunately. I mean, luckily, the peaks, the peaks for these tend to be uh, kind of, they don't clash. So it's intended uh, that the school will actually use a lot of the sports facilities between the hours of 8 and 4. Uh, anyway, so therefore there's not a lot of, and then as Mark mentioned from the service we're undertaking, the, the business peak is typically set in, uh, in the evening and obviously on the weekend it's uh, early in the morning. Um, in terms of the congestion point, any obviously already using the access, it's for, from a transport point of view, we find it beneficial to have it further away from this junction, just to allow for less interchange that's taking place in that location, to allow to keep that back of the highway to prevent anybody turning out or blocking back into Woodlands Avenue itself. So all those aspects have been reviewed and we're, we're comfortable that the scheme in front of us is is the best that, um, that we can achieve too. Yeah, I guess you want to come back? If I could just come back on one point, thank you very much for that explanation and I'm <coughs> somewhat reassured. Um, but you did mention yellow lines. Uh, that road is not adopted. Uh, will it still be some way that the Borough Council overall can enforce safety it's safety, not parking. <coughs> yeah, I mean, well, in terms of safety, there are, luckily through the Addington School Scheme, there was a um, Bournemouth Shop Road, there was some footpath sideway improvements on that link. There was a new footpath link as well to the, the eastern side, which has been shown. I think it comes down to, it's not, you're right, it's not an adopted road. Uh, it is owned and operated. You can have, that's the, one of the reasons I spoke to our parking management team, because that currently is outsourced to a private firm which run uh, our CPE enforcement. Uh, I think the conversation we've been having with them because you are able to apply parking management uh, restrictions on private land, which is one of the reasons why we had those conversations, but that wouldn't be something that's operated by the council, it's operated by the highways. Uh, as an adopted highway, it would be operated by the council through its um, property of private land. So I'm understanding from that, yes, the council can operate safety parking <coughs> matters, how do you do it, I don't mind. Yes. Wayne? I may have missed this, Chris. How many did you say the cumulative of the three sites were in terms of total parking spaces? Oh, uh, 
Uh, have you got the food in the hand? We didn't do this. It's in the report, I think it's 274. 274. Let's check. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, that, that more than covers it with the appropriate yeah. management plan. And I think that let's hope they all get used and then it will have to pay for the maintenance yeah. you're worried about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we don't often give our officers much praise on their presentation, but I have to say, it's not often, you know, your presentation tonight, Mark, was very concise, to the point, and I think it's very well done. Um, what I'd also like to say is support what Councillor Baker said. This is long overdue, the place is an eyesore, and, I'm, and if you look at page 28, where it says, the community looks forward to the development being completed. <coughs> that sums it up. I think the sooner we get on with it, the better. Yeah. Okay, if there are no other questions. I'd say for an application of this size, it's the first time I've seen one that there have been no objection, so it does show how good it is and how needed it is. Right. Before I go to the vote, you did mention a, adding another condition. Could you just read it out again, just so members are clear, please? So the um, provisional wording I have is um, the development hereby approved shall be carried out in accordance with the energy and sustainability statement, and then insert the reference number, demonstrating at least 10% of the energy, energy being generated is from low carbon or renewable sources, unless otherwise agreed in writing by the local planning authority, and then the reason will be in accordance with policy CCO5 of the MDD local plan to ensure the development minimises energy consumption of the principles of sustainable development. Okay. Thank you very much. Right, so the recommendation then is set out on page 18, which is for approval, and that is subject to the following conditions and a unilateral undertaking securing the car park management framework and employment skills plan. We've had that extra condition, and on the members' update, there is an amend on condition 10. So all those in favour of this application, please show. And that is unanimous, so that application is passed. Thank you very much, members. Three bedrooms, 
parking in the, in the form of um, two parking spaces or um, in the uncovered form for the, the three plots one and three and garaging at the southern end of the site for plots four and five. The three additional car spaces on the roadway for an un un unallocated and easy use. The um, property is located in flood zone one, two, and three. The area here, this section here, is located in flood zone three, being immediately adjacent to Whitefield Brook and the London River. Flood zone one is concentrated in this top corner here, the majority of the site, including where the dwellings are located in flood zone two. Um, the rates of emissions received um, against the proposal, four of which come from Orpington Close to the north. Orpington Close is a, is a similar development from um, dating from approval in 2003 for 15 dwellings. It's accessed from a different access handle off um, Hurst Road. Uh, it was consulted to the Environment Agency and found to be acceptable at the time. Uh, based on the flood risk assessment that was undertaken for that site. Um, the proposal in this instance involves implementing raised flood levels uh, annotated in green on the slide here. Um, it is undertaken to ensure that the, the finished floor level of the dwellings is, uh, uh, the, sorry, is above the flood level, accommodating 35% climate change and free board. Uh, the flood level is effectively the bank or the western side of the green line, of uh, the, the green annotation there. Um, it is 36.5, which generally correlates with the properties to the north. The dwellings here have been um, cited to take account of that flood level. They're also cited to take account of the surrounding um, built form as well. The majority of the objections that were received were related to the flood concerns. Um, several other concerns listed. Related to the character and the, uh, the, country, well, the adjoining countryside location. Um, light pollution from the roadway at the northern end of the site and the impacts on number 15 Orpington. Uh, construction noise and traffic generation. There are no objections to the application on those grounds. Councils um, consulted with the Environment Agency in relation to flooding and drainage issues. They've reviewed the proposal and requested amendments to the flood risk assessment. Um, and most recently, as of the June 2018, the scheme was found to be acceptable based on the findings of the flood risk assessment. Um, Condition 12 um, has been amended in the members update to take account of the most recent um, advice from the Environment Agency, which was um, inadvertently not modified from the most recent advice. The members update also makes reference to um, the fact there is a compliance amount of parking on the site in part four five. It also makes uh, clarifies an issue in uh, a point in paragraph fifty one in relation to uh, electrical plugs, which were required in the flood risk assessment. Um, sorry, specified as, as as a measure that should be investigated, incorporated in the flood risk assessment. It's just making a point that it's not necessarily required to meet the flood risk assessment requirements. Thank you very much. First question to speak and then is Graham Brown, a resident of Gutter. Come forward, please. Good evening. Good evening, councillors. I'm here on behalf of uh, 
of residents at all that's in close to it, which is sitting behind me. Our main objection to this is the potential flooding damage to our properties and the sewage management system at the bottom of Gorgonson Close, uh, caused by surface water drainage alteration and increased high levels in the floodplain. Next slide, please. In the information packet, as the officer just quoted, it is across the flood, flood zones one, two, and three. The vast majority of submissions obviously relate to drainage and body indications. We live there, we're concerned about our properties being flooded. Next slide, please. The graphic on the left is from the Environment Agency. We get regular updates from the Environment Agency on flooding, on flood warnings. This is at the back of our property, so of course we're concerned. The graphic on the right represents the flooding earlier on this year. That's a shot from April. The brown area is actually, it was completely underwater. The blue area, which is halfway, at least halfway across the proposed new development, um, the water table is right at ground level. Next slide, please. Again, floodplain, as we know, the majority is in um, two. The slide that the officer conveniently that's in your pack on, I can't remember what page it is now, conveniently shows in blue water draining to the left. If you review carefully the flood levels, the land levels here, and I have, and it's in part of my submission, the details here, the actual level is actually one metre above my back garden, which isn't going to be very pleasant, and something like 60 centimetres above the level of Orkington Close. The sewage management system is in the corner here, if that floods, all the sewers in all bits of parts will back up. Okay, next slide please. This is Twyford Brook at the back of, at the, back of the field. The grating here is around the, the drain for the, the surface water drains. That's already been compounded by the development in um, Wellington Close. Additional surface water, well, it comes out here, but it's actually below the water level, so it'll back all the way up into um, certainly how orbits and close which is at the lower level. This is the in the field where the new surface water drain went in. When they tried to put that in, you can see the surface, there's the water. They had to pump that continuously to drop the drain in. The water is not going to flow through that drain when, the, when it floods. And it'll come up into orbits and close. Next slide, please. We're concerned about this developer. He's already contra contradicting clause, clauses 12 and 13 which are in your um, information pack. They've already started scraping the soil and raising, and raising the levels of the, um, of the land. So, next slide please. So who will be liable when flooding causes damage to the properties and sewage system all in place and is the council covered? Therefore we are against the motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> next we have Jim Bailey, the agent. Would you like to come forward? Thank you, Chairman. Um, the principle of building five dwellings on this site has been established um, because the site was part of an allocation in the management, managing to the development of every plan in, for around 20 dwellings. Uh, 12 dwellings have already been built on the land to the south, and there is land to the northeast which which may become available in the future for some additional dwellings. The site's in a highly sustainable location, lying within easy walking and cycling distance of Twyford Station and the shopping centre to the north. Uh, the design of the five houses is considered